September 8, 1950 became a special day in the history of Greenwood Village and the lives of its people. That late summer day was the beginning of Greenwood Village, the beginning of a legacy of challenge, leadership, and achievement, the beginning of a collective community commitment to quality of life, a legacy that endures today. Half a century ago, Greenwood Village was a land strewn with farms, dairies, gravel roads, and a population of 500 residents. Today, that rural heritage has been preserved with the addition of a developed, dynamic blend of urban and residential areas, and nationally recognized business parks. Our population has grown to 15,000 residents, with a daytime population topping 75,000 people. This is a story of how citizens, community leaders, and elected officials built a strong foundation on which our village stands today. This is a story of the joys and struggles of the birth and growth of our village. This is a story of our quality of life in Greenwood Village. Our heritage began in the early 1850s when many Native Americans passed through the area that became Arapahoe County. By 1850, the Arapaho and Cheyenne Indians signed a treaty giving them the eastern plains between the South Platte River near Fort Lupton and the Arkansas River in southeastern Colorado. The Ute Indians lived in central and western Colorado and would come to Arapaho County to trade and hunt. Greenwood Village resident Tom Lindsay, who grew up in the 1920s and 30s, remembers picking up arrowheads on his land on Long Road. How we come to find them, we were just playing around in the creek one day. And one of the girls said, Tom, do you think that's an Indian hair? So we took it to school. And they said, yeah. So we didn't tell nobody where we got it. And we got, I guess, about six or seven more different sizes. And one had, still had a stick on it with the rope tied part well, and I don't know what happened to him. Gold shaped the West, and the precious metal shaped our heritage. Prospectors first discovered gold near present-day Inglewood in 1858. Gold brought early settlers like John Melvin, who came to Colorado from Connecticut in 1859 and purchased 320 acres along Cherry Creek. John and Jane Melvin lived in a three-room log cabin, which was later expanded to a hotel and restaurant known as the 12 Mile House because it was 12 miles from Denver. The community of Melvin grew. Melvin School was located just east of Jordan Road and Bellevue Avenue. Pioneer Rufus Clark came to Colorado in 1859 and bought 160 acres along the Platte River. Clark raised potatoes and was so successful, his farm soon grew to 20,000 acres, which he called the Clark Colony. His neighbors nicknamed him Potato Clark. Rufus Clark's farm included much of what is now Greenwood Village east of Holly Street. By the early 1900s, the area was largely agricultural. Orchards of cherry, apple, apricot, plum, and pear trees thrived. But in 1933, disaster struck. The Castlewood Dam burst. The floodwaters washed out three bridges. Since it was in the height of the Depression, the dam was not rebuilt, drying up the source of irrigation. Some residents turned to dry land farming, but after the orchards died, many took jobs in Denver. Only the dairy farmers were still able to make a living. Well, the dairy farmers, it was easy because uh, you could still do the dry farming. We had enough rain during the summer because it was always scary if you were going to get enough rain or too much hail. But it did work. And so a lot of them did go into dairy farming, but not to the extent that they had when they had water enough to feed the animals because now they had to go into Littleton and beyond to get the hay and alfalfa to feed them. And where we're standing used to be an enormous alfalfa field that my grandfather had. At the same time, pioneer Cyrus G. Richardson built the Greenwood Ranch. Richardson's influence and Greenwood Ranch was the inspiration for the name of our city, Greenwood Village. Several African-American families became prominent farmers and ranchers in the Greenwood Village area. 
William Lindsay was a porter on the Union Pacific Railroad when he purchased 30 acres of land west of Colorado Boulevard and north of Orchard Road. You had a dirt road and the county would grade it about once a month and then it would get bumped, bumpy again and as far as anything else was working, you know, we had, to, like I say, had the barn, we had seven, eight cows at a time to milk. Uh, Dad loved to go to the mountains, and we'd try to go to the mountains at least three to four times a year. He, he, he really just go up and ride around, have a picnic, and come on down. And one of us would have to stay here and start the evening milk if we got, you know, come back late. Other newcomers to the area were Gladys and William Carson. The Carsons bought 20 acres of dry farmland near Orchard Road and Quebec Street to raise cattle. The early years were a struggle for the Carson family. The Carsons hauled water from a neighbor's place and lived without telephone or electricity. But hard work paid off and they purchased additional land until they had 130 acres. Today, the Carson Farm includes Greenwood Plaza, William McKinley Carson Park, and Greenwood Village City Hall. While the Carsons and the Lindsays were farming the west side of the area, Francis Williams was farming the east side of the area. It was just dry land, dry land, but uh, it was a whole black farming community. Almost everybody was on a 10 acre minimum and uh, the whole oh, two square mile was black families trying to scratch a living off of here. I don't know if it was the good life or not. I don't know if this is the good life or that is the good life. You know, they, sometimes they, like they say in the song, they'll pave over heaven and put in a parking lot. But, uh, yeah, well, Sarah can tell you, because uh, when the road came through there, she always wanted him to pave the road, that dust and stuff. Now they pave the road and you can't get out on it. <laughs> so I don't know, good or bad, but nevertheless it was a high, windy area. She wanted me to name the place Windy Acres. <laughs> During the 1930s and 40s, the area became a mixture of farmers, suburbanites, and Denver residents who would come south to country homes for the summer. Farmers began to subdivide their land for homes and businesses. By 1950, residents began to worry that the development creeping south would threaten their pastoral lifestyles. That threat became reality when Inglewood proposed a plan to condemn land owned by Mrs. Thomas Savage on Bellevue Avenue to construct a reservoir. Mrs. Savage and her neighbors were worried about the trend of development. They enlisted their neighbor, Charles Raleigh Enos, a lawyer, to protect their rural lifestyle by forming their own city. I was fortunate in knowing Charles Enos, who was the founding father of the city. He and I did business together back in the 40s and he was a wonderful man, and I knew about his dreams for this city. We talked about it frequently, and he had the idea that this community should be a very open and relaxed kind of a community, just to let people do what they wanted to do. Petitions with 80 signatures favoring incorporation were submitted to Arapahoe County Judge Henry Teller, who ordered the incorporation election of Greenwood Village on September 8, 1950 at Curtis School. Charles Enos was the instigator. And Charles Enos, he was the one that did all the work, all the law work and everything. He and a Charles Beaker. Voters felt strongly on both sides. Those in favor of incorporation wanted to control zoning, while farmers opposed incorporation for several reasons. We uh, fought it two or three times, trying to keep it out, because the farmers know what, what was going to happen. You see, you want to start, and a lot of the farmers was right because 
they couldn't, they didn't have, you know, enough money to keep going on the farm, and they would sell out real cheap pretty soon. There was not too many here, and then Greenwood Village started. All of 138 qualified voters turned out to vote. The election was close, 74 to 64. But the town of Greenwood Village became a reality. The new town was three miles long, bounded by Bellevue Avenue, Holly Street, Orchard Road, and South Clarkson Street. Founding father Charles Enos became the first mayor. Enos presided over the first meeting of the town board of trustees on October 6, 1950 at Curtis School. In the 1950s and 60s, money was an immediate concern and continued to be a concern for this newly formed town with a strong vision for a community. Lack of and entire lack of money, had no collection system, and no money was forced to reach to the mayor and the council. There was not a city hall in those days, so the informal base of operations for the town was at the home of the town's second mayor, John Calkins. In fact, the Calkins 60-year-old barn was used as the town's maintenance department. You always knew what the weather was by watching whether the lights were on at the barn because guys were going out in the middle of the night. While Greenwood Village was forming, Lindy and Margaret Ciala were moving their family to Ulster Street, where the Denver Technological Center stands today. What the area looked like when we first moved out here looked like uh, maybe a picture from Grapes of Wrath, I'd say. And, uh, a lot of tumbleweed, and when the wind blew, tumbleweed looks almost like buffalo moving through the area. Uh, these farmers had had many, many years of drought, and uh, this is why we were able to buy as cheaply as we bought back in the 50s, and the ground was going for like $500 an acre at that time. But there While town government was getting its start, families were continuing to move south from Denver for the rural lifestyle. Bob and Ming Plunkett farmed the area bounded by Colorado Boulevard and Long Road. Well, when we moved out here in 1956, it was pretty much a rural area, and uh, Co uh, Colorado Boulevard was just a cow path up there. Then the next thing we did was build the Quonset Hut barn. And uh, we made, we had three stalls in the barn that we wanted to have dirt floors so it'd be the barn later, but we wanted to live in it. So we put down plywood and made floors in, in the stall. So the first stall was for two girls, second stall, two boys, and us in the third. <laughs> and we had everything from electricity, you know, all the modern conveniences in there. Greenwood Village still kept its agricultural and rural character. In the 1950s, the village had the largest 4-H group in Colorado. The club had 52 members who raised animals, studied birds, and planted trees. We were able to be in 4-H and Little Bridges, which is not the opportunity anymore for kids to do. In 4-H, they learned so many different things. We broke the club up into different groups. Uh, we had a bird, bird group that was run by Mr. Fretchner, who studied under Mr. Needrock from the Colorado State Museum there, and he knew all about birds. And then we had another group that was a forestry group, and those kids learned to do all kinds of gardening and planting tree, trees and, and have a little nursery full of trees and, and had a... As farming and ranching characterized the area in the early part of the century, annexations defined Greenwood Village from the mid-1960s through the present. Greenwood Village faced financial challenges throughout its first two decades, until commercial development came along to help pay the bills. Dr. John Wood, a local pathologist, served as mayor from 1965 through 1967. During his administration, the three-square-mile town took its first growth spurt, annexing land east of Holly Street to Dayton Street and north to Union Avenue. Well, John Wood was the mayor before I was the mayor, and it was during his administration that the city annexed the biggest 
section of their commercial property, which of course is now the Denver Tech Center. So all subsequent annexations really began with his administration. In the early 1960s, while young families were raising children, George Wallace would soon be inspired to begin development of the nationally recognized business park, the Denver Technological Center. He had a successful consulting firm and officed in downtown Denver, but he was not comfortable with that environment and wanted to move his company and his employees out to a uh, more suburban setting place them in, a, in an environment where they not only could have plenty of uh, open space, uh, but hopefully live in the immediate proximity. So out of that arose George's vision of the Denver Tech Center. Some of the land George Wallace wanted to buy was occupied by longtime residents. When George Wallace first bought this property out here or in this area, there had been a lot of other developers or so-called developers that came here before that and everyone had grandiose ideas but none of them had uh, really backing to, uh, to uh, uh, really carry it out. And when uh, George Wallace came out, my wife said, no, this guy sounds pretty legitimate. You ought to maybe talk to him. And that's when George came out in our house set right back here and he, he explained what he was going to do and uh, his idea of the tech center. It really made this area. I mean, uh, you, there's no fooling anybody. Uh, we have uh, a good planned area. We have a lot of open space as uh, compared to, say, having, if you work downtown. Uh, no, I think his, uh, his ideas were great. Due to annexations, the town of Greenwood Village had changed in character and geography. Several changes were needed for the village government and its people. The uh, city council that was elected at the same time I did really had two major objectives. One was to become a home rule city and the other was to adopt a master plan for the city. I think we recognized the fact that the city was going to change in character by the addition of the commercial property and it was very important to preserve the rural nature of the city so that it didn't lose all of the essential value that it had. So I asked one of the councilmen who his name was Val Dean if he would head up the project and he and Harold Patton was very helpful interviewed and hired a city planner by the name of Joe Marlowe. And Joe wrote our first master plan. A home rule charter is necessary for a municipality, no matter how big the municipality is, because it allows that city to govern themselves as opposed to being under the rules and laws of the state. So, for instance, we had the right to levy taxes, under a home rule charter, and we would have the right, and probably, maybe even more importantly, we had the right to control our zoning. From 1969 to 1977 was a time of great growth and challenges for the city of Greenwood Village. Additional land in the Denver Technological Center and Greenwood Plaza were targets for annexation. Even more compelling, Denver was annexing to the south and east. We were exceedingly concerned with Denver's annexations at that time. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, some uh, irreverent observer uh, thought Denver might annex clear to Pueblo. Um, the unfortunate aspects of the Denver annexations were that uh, Denver Public School District Number 1 moved coincident with the city and county of Denver annexations. So at that time, uh, school districts that had not been part of the Denver system uh, were being annexed, uh, gobbled up, if you will, by Denver School District Number One. Denver's efforts on annexation prompted Frida Poundstone to draft an amendment to the Colorado Constitution that bears her name. Denver was annexing and was annexing uh, very dramatically. Matter of fact, it even took the area that was Yosemite and Bellevue 
on the, um, would that be the west side, uh, that went into Denver while we were doing the Poundstone Amendment. And so we would have been in a posture of having a handful of residents and a school district and absolutely no tax dollars. So Denver Tech Center and working with us was extremely important for us to make sure that we were able to keep that in Greenwood and protect the, the tax base because the Cherry Creek School District, Greenwood, was the only protection it had. The 1970 annexation brought additional commercial sites into Greenwood Village, making development subject to Greenwood's master plan and stricter zoning. John Madden developed much of the commercial area west of Interstate 25, known today as Greenwood Plaza. Well, we and the city together wrote the zoning restrictions, so uh, what you see, if you like, uh, probably uh, the credit should be shared mutually. It was between the various governments of Greenwood and uh, ourselves. The early 70s were good years for Greenwood Village. The city acquired undeveloped land at Holly Street and Orchard Road for its first pocket park. It wasn't until September 22, 1975, that residents would endure conflict and tough times that would put the city and its quality of life in peril. Uh, there had been some contests uh, uh, mounted by people who were a portion of the annexation and did not choose to be in Greenwood. Uh, those, uh, those ultimately were heard by, by the courts and, uh, and, in fact, by the Supreme Court of Colorado. And the, uh, the outcome was that the city was uh, bisected. It was torn asunder. Uh, the annexations, uh, annexations were ruled invalid, and um, we had to begin anew. The, the timing couldn't have been worse. In order to get the whole city together and be able to have the revenues that we would need to have to run the city for the ensuing year, we had to have a mill levy assessed and certified to the county by a certain date. We were about eight weeks away from that date when the, when the ruling came down. With a large area back in Arapahoe County, villagers worked day and night scrambling for signatures to re-annex all the commercial and residential property that had been lost overnight. Everything west of Holly Street had to be petitioned back into the city. We did that over two weekends, perhaps. We covered the entire area west of Holly. On December 25, 1975, Greenwood Village officially re-annexed approximately 1,580 acres. In the late 1970s, parks and open space became a priority for the village. Mayor Sam Jenkins was elected mayor in 1977 and instituted a foundation for green belts, parks, and open space. Uh, mayor Jenkins had had the time and inclination to manage the city on a day-to-day -day basis, um, although he did have a full-time job at the same time. By 1978, Greenwood Village had 35 employees and their first city hall, a two-story structure complex at South Quebec Street. By the early 1980s, the village had acquired its first large park, Village Greens. Beginning in 1981, due to the development of the Denver Technological Center and Greenwood Plaza, Mayor Fred Fisher began to lead the village in addressing transportation issues. The arterials and even the interstate highway had not been designed to carry the traffic that was becoming necessary. I think rather though than focus on fixing the traffic problems which were manageable in the short term, we really spent more of a time looking at the growth issue and trying to set up some longer range growth restrictions uh, so that we wouldn't run into gridlock down the road. In the late 1980s, the village continued its annexation efforts with the annexation of businesses along Arapahoe Road. Mayor Frieda Poundstone, who served from 1985 to 1989, recalls a special memory during her tenure. This park was special to me, and I think the reason it was special to me is Tommy Davis 
Jr., who lived in Green Oaks at that particular time, was on the Parks and Trails Board. And when we were doing the annexation, he worked very hard with me, and then he became very ill. And when this park was built, there was a general consensus among the council and myself that this should be named the Tommy Davis Park after one of our residents. Most cities don't do that, but we're so close to our people that we do. And I think it was just, um, this was just a wonderful memory. When I see this park and I see the trees that have been planted, and some were planted especially for Tommy Davis, that I think that means something. It leaves a memory for his children and a memory of goodness for the city. During his term as mayor, Roland Barnard's quest was to bring calmness and civility to Greenwood Village. It became a time of healing for the city of Greenwood Village. I felt that the city needed to be directed uh, in the area of quiet and agreement. And therefore, when, when the opportunity came to adopt some kind of a slogan as to what we were going to try to do, I expressed my desire to try to be a, a leader in the effort to get things quieted down, stop the arguments, work together, and get some things accomplished quietly, because really, Greenwood Village is a wonderful city, and it's larger now than it was when I was mayor, but it's still a small city. The early 90s continued to bring positive changes to the village when Mayor David Hull was elected. Focused on making Greenwood Village a more special place than it was, the community started to evolve. The authorities wanted to expand the airport, make it a commercial airport with uh, scheduled aviation flights. Uh, we did not like that for a number of reasons. One was the flight patterns are over the city of Greenwood Village, which would meant more air traffic over our city. And the other is the infrastructure of the area just won't handle the extra traffic loads uh, that this airport uh, would generate. During my term as mayor, we enhanced the quality of life of Greenwood Village in several ways. One was we established a street program to repave all the streets and keep them clean on a weekly basis. We also purchased parkland. We purchased the Westlands Park, which is presently under development. We purchased Silo Park and completed that park as a park. The park that we're in right now is a park that was completed during the administration. We also established a flower program to get some color in the city. Everything was green for Greenwood Village and we decided to establish more color. So the flower program started and I think it's been very successful. With a new and improved look for the village, Mayor David Pfeiffer took over the realm of the village's mayoral seat in 1997. Immediately charged with leading the village into the new millennium, Mayor Pfeiffer was tasked with addressing a number of issues and facilitating important decisions that would make the village a leading community in the region. Well, the annexation issue came up because we were trying to bring in uh, some of the retail along Arapaho Road and to bring in some of the neighborhoods that had had requested to be brought in. It was made out to be that we were just trying to gobble up all the dollars and that just was the farthest thing in the world from the truth because we had many of the local neighborhoods that were in the unincorporated area of Arapahoe County that wanted to become a part of Greenwood Village and the only way that it made economic sense to bring them in is to bring in retail and commercial and that was the premise uh, of bringing about the annexation uh, that we worked so hard to make happen for many of the citizens that lived in the unincorporated area of Arapaho County. We had different individuals uh, working against us who uh, really wanted to create the city of Centennial. So we continued the fight all the way through the Colorado Supreme Court and they won. Uh, and uh, we are still friends today. This all came up because we were fearful of the Cherry Creek Crossing. The Cherry Creek Crossing was our concern that 
off of Parker Road, there could be a road put through to Orchard that would bring people from Orchard into the Tech Center area, uh, just bringing more traffic, especially past our schools, past our residential communities, that it just wasn't necessary to do. We mediated an agreement and we did an annexation and our annexation went from the roadway all the way out almost to Arapaho Road on both sides and brought it back so that nobody could go across uh, the roadway. And I one morning had the city staff put a barricade across Jordan Road at Bellevue. And it, has, it never came down until they reworked the uh, roadway through the park. But youth were very important to me, and we put together the youth program. We challenged them to come back to us with their ideas, and as bright as they are, they came back with some absolutely fabulous things that they, they prepared. Then one day they came and wanted to build a skate park. We challenged those young people at the time that the city is not going to pay for this for themselves. You have to go raise money. And they did. We had huge issues with water quality at Cherry Creek Reservoir and the runoff and, and all of the issues with how we try to clean the water before it ever gets to the reservoir. And the city has worked very closely with all of the surrounding areas, a prime example of all the effort that go, has gone into uh, ensuring that the quality level uh, of the water in the reservoir is maintained. We all live in the city of Greenwood Village, but our mailing address was Inglewood, Colorado, 80111. And we have a very large population base, especially at noon, when all of our office buildings, they're not in Inglewood, they're in Greenwood Village. So with the help of council members, uh, we convinced uh, the, the Postal Service to let us use Greenwood Village, Colorado, in our mailing address and that then became the Greenwood Village Post Office on South Dayton just south of Arapaho Road. Greenwood Village has always been at the forefront for quality and vision. In 2003, Mayor Nancy Sharp, with her devotion to honor relationships and collaboration, safeguarded the quality of life of Greenwood Village during a time when the character of the community was beginning to change and during a recession when the village's future financial stability was questioned. The T-Rex project was really an interesting one because from the beginning we had to form a really strong coalition to get the financing and, and that went back many, many years to make sure that the project went forward. But we couldn't just do it one city alone, we needed to pull together a lot of entities, all the cities, the counties, the business community, the metropolitan districts, a lot of folks had to come together to make sure that that project was successful. First of all, that the vote was, the, uh, that it was passed by the electorate, that was the first step. And then making sure that the elements of the um, project that benefited Greenwood Village and us along the corridor were included. And most specifically, at first, it was supposed to be only light rail. And we worked very hard when I was on council um, before I became mayor to make sure that, uh, in fact, the lanes were added to the project as well. It became a roadway and a light rail project. The parking garage was an interesting one at the Arapaho Light Rail Station because if it had the parking garage had developed where it was originally planned, that would have meant that the that particular station would have changed completely in its look and feel. People would have come right across um, the bridge and gone right into the garage, gotten in their car and gone home. The development opportunities there would have been very limited. So what we did is we pushed the garage 
a way over and, and combined it with the Colorado Department of Transportation maintenance facility that we did try to move to a different location, but we're not successful with that. But combined the two and left an open parcel of about three acres that's available for development to the city of Greenwood Village. Again, it's a wonderful thing just combining those two facilities, which was not an easy thing to do um, and was expensive, but in the long term, it'll benefit the city of Greenwood Village for many, many years. Mixed-use development has been an interesting aspect of the light rail project being uh, completed. It is something that developers and communities really look at is how can a development be brought together that has uh, access to work, residential, and whether it's retail or restaurants. So it's bringing all of those components together and how can people live and work and recreate in the same area that, uh, in, all in the same area. So that was kind of a new concept for us and we went through a number of studies and a number of iterations as city council and staff trying to decide what was best for us and what was our vision of what needed to be in the city of Greenwood Village. When the landmark development came forward with residential towers and a lot of restaurant retail, it was a concept that we looked very hard and very carefully at and, and it was redevelopment of a, I think it was a two-story building at the time. So I, in the long run, I think it's worked out really well. It's a, it certainly is, it's called a landmark and it is becoming a landmark. It's a quality uh, looking development and I think it will stay that way for a long time. At the uh, Arapaho light rail station on the west side, we've done some, I think, some wonderful things in partnering with the ownership of the buildings down there in terms of making the walkways more walkable, slowing down traffic, putting in some traffic stops. And, and a lot of that is this mixed use development. And we'd like to minimize the traffic as much as possible. So if we can do that, have people live and work in the same area or ride the light rail to that area, really reduces the traffic and over a long period of time that benefits our community and it benefits the commuters, it benefits the employees. Open space has always been something that has been very important to me as an elected official. I think we have very few places in a metropolitan area left that are not developed that need to be preserved from development so that residents today and in the future can enjoy all of those places, whether they're open space and they're undeveloped park or they are enhancements to the beautiful places that we have. That is a part of what makes our community such a wonderful one. We have miles and miles of trail, lots and lots of acres of open space and parks. And I think when people come into our community, not only for us that live here, but from the surrounding communities in the metropolitan area, they look and are able to enjoy the things that we have. One of the things that was the most important to me was the Marjorie Perry Nature Preserve. When I first started on the city council, there were two lots that were developable lots that were in what we call the horseshoe, which is inside the uh, Highline Canal uh, Trail. And if those lots had been, had some, I'm sure, some absolutely beautiful homes built on them, it would have changed the character of that nature preserve. And we were very fortunate to have work with Coble and Company, Trust Republic Land, South Metro Conservancy, and others, the Arapaho County Open Space and Arapaho County, to make sure that that land was preserved. And so we put four and a half acres into what was already about 50 acres. And then now there's a conservation easement on that entire area. So it will never be developed. It will be something that people from all over our community can enjoy 
in perpetuity. And that is something that I think is, has been really, really important to me, um, that, that that's something that not only today, but for it, it'll always be a beautiful place. All of the councils have always taken an approach of being fiscally conservative and making investments wisely, saving some money, or creating what's now called the rainy day fund. It has been really important for our councils to have taken that approach because now in the last almost seven years that I've been mayor, we've had a recession about seven years ago and now we're having another one, which is the last couple of years have been really much, much more difficult on the economy in this country and the economy in our city. But because of that planning, we have fared very well. We have paid off all of our city debt. We have a rainy day fund. We live within our means. That means we do not spend more than the revenues that we collect. And that's just our responsibility to our taxpayers that make investments in our community. That's our responsibility to make sure that we are good stewards of the money that they provide to us. We'll still have a very strong community. We have a great place to work. We have a strong employment base and we have a strong community base. We have not and will not sacrifice the services that we provide to our residents, nor to our business community. 60 years ago, a group of citizens were inspired to protect the land they fought so hard to preserve. Their hard work and determination and their vision of quality of life have matured into a city of which we are most proud. For the past 60 years, residents, community leaders, and elected officials have worked diligently to enhance and protect the quality of life in Greenwood Village. The joys and struggles of the community, the legacy of leadership, people, and spirit of the community will remain a part of our lives and for the lives of future generations. Quality of life in Greenwood Village will always be important as it was for our founding fathers, first-time residents, and current generations. Happy 60th anniversary, Greenwood Village.